I want to welcome you all to the next session here, Gen Z in the Classroom, Creating the Future. I'm thrilled to be here with two esteemed colleagues, uh, Sarah Jones, who's at the Cass School for Business. I was running a really exciting program. I'll let her tell you all about that. And then we've also got Frederick Kleinhammer, uh, who has a really interesting career, spanning both higher education and then working for creative industries, uh, as well as for Google. And we'll share both some of his experience as an educator and then also in industry and hiring students uh, and engaging with the next generation. So I'll start by sharing a little bit of our research study. We did this study internationally. We interviewed students in the UK, in the US, uh, in Australia and Germany. I'll share the UK results in particular today, though the results are all online, and it's interesting to see some of the differences and similarities across the different regions. We interviewed more than 500 students uh, in 11, this 11 to 17 year old age range, and then their teachers as well, to get a sense of how they learn, what they're interested in, and how they think about their futures. So one of the things that was clear and is not a surprise is that for Gen Z, this is their native environment. Technology is how they engage in the world. It's how they engage socially, it's how they learn. They have grown up with the internet in their pocket, with the ability to access information easily, to share it, and to get feedback from a broad community. They, as the, when they define themselves, they use technology or electronics as one of the key terms in what defines their generation. They also talk about being more creative than past generations. And some of that is about having new canvases, new ways to create, new ways to express, and new ways to engage with the world. We also know that these are students who are both nervous and excited about their future. We asked them to describe how they thought about it, and these were the two that bubbled to the top, which I think speaks to the kind of change that they're facing. The future's uncertain. They're not quite sure what the world of work will look like by the time they get there. And I think for those of us in education, we certainly see that as well, that change is happening quite rapidly. We also know that both of these students and teachers don't feel quite prepared for this uncertain future. And there's a question about how do you prepare someone for a future where change will be a critical element? What are the kinds of skills and knowledge they'll need in order to be successful in the coming environment? One of the other things that struck me about this research is that more than a third of students talk about learning outside of the classroom as more important for their futures than what happens inside of the classroom. And some of this, in looking through the verbatims, is about YouTube. Some of it is about their network and their community and the way they learn from their peers. But some of it is also opportunities for internship, chances to work on projects that have real-world applications that help connect them to the world beyond the classroom. As we looked through the verbatims from the teachers and saw some of the things that they included, they certainly see this generation as different. They see them as coming in with a different kind of expectation about how they'll use technology. And so their, their relationship with a textbook is different than in the past. They've got information available on their phones. So if a textbook's not updated, they don't trust it quite as much. Now, coming here from the US, I have some real concerns about digital literacy and how people are able to tell fact from fiction. Uh, and I think that's increasingly true for these students as well. How will we help them be able to navigate a world where there is so much information coming at them from such a wide range of sources? Both students and teachers agree that learning by creating, by doing, is the best way for Gen Z to learn. But they also report that this is not the most common way in which they learn in classrooms. That they learn more often by listening, they learn more often by reading. Still valuable ways of learning, but they want opportunities to dive in, to get their hands dirty, to experiment, to try. Then we also see incredible agreement from both students and educators that they wish there was more of a focus on creativity in the classroom. There was more opportunity to develop and flex their creative muscles. There was an opportunity in the classroom for, to work on problems that don't just have one right answer, that allow students to explore. As they look into the future, both students and educators see that they need to understand technology in order to be prepared for the future. They also see that creativity plays a critical role in solving many of the challenges that we face. 
and they see that being creative is essential to their success, their individual success, and the success of the ventures that they're engaged in. Technology is going to be an enabler for their creativity, for their path. One of the questions we asked were, was around, what are your favorite classes to take? We also asked, what classes require creativity, and what are the classes that prepare you for the future? And what you see in the center is that technology aligns with all three of those. Those are the students' favorite classes. They require creativity, and they prepare them for the future. And I think you'll, you'll hear from uh, Sarah Jones later about the importance of having students who not just have deep knowledge, but broad knowledge. And I think that's, that's part of what this speaks to, that technology can help be a tool that allows students to stretch across disciplines. So again, as they look forward, it's hard to imagine what this future looks like. And 96% of teachers think their Gen Z students will one day have careers that don't exist yet today. And so here's the challenge for higher education. How will we prepare them effectively for this world that hasn't been invented yet and that these students will be helping participate to create? So one of the things that struck me as I looked through this study is the commonality, the agreement between students and educators. And certainly they see that technology is a defining characteristic. They want to create and do. And I think that's a question for the university level. Where do students have opportunities to do and create? How can we ensure that they have more of those opportunities to learn? They're concerned about being prepared for their future. How will they ensure that they have the kinds of skills and knowledge they need to be successful? They want more of a focus on creativity in the classroom, and they see that same creativity is really critical as they're solving the problems that we all face today. So, I wanted to give you some of that context. Uh, Adobe has done this research as a way to understand who's coming. It affects certainly the way in which we think about product, but I serve on Adobe's education team. I'm interested in how do we inspire and empower this generation to be creators. And so this research is certainly helpful to me in my work, and I wanted to share it with you all because I think it raises some important questions within the higher education space. So I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Sarah Jones, and give her a chance to share with you uh, some of the work that she's done at the CAST Business School. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Tacey. Um, I'm here to share some of the um, things we've been doing recently um, on a program for which I'm course director at um, CAS. It's a Master's in Innovation, Creativity and Leadership. And I think it responds to some of the kind of um, issues that we've just been hearing about in previous sessions. Um, so my first, um, we've heard this a lot, um, my starting point is the only constant is change. Um, and in particular, um, change in technology. I mean, so much here around us today is reminding us of that. Um, in case you needed any more reminders, there's some examples here of the way in which technology is changing in these fields of energy, neuroscience, genetics, nanotechnology, in ways that will impact all of us exponentially over the coming years, all down to this kind of the famous Moore's law predicting that um, computer processing power would double every two years and continue to do so. so I think um, this is really nicely summarized, actually in a um, LinkedIn post by a colleague, Heather, Heather McGowan, um, who's just pointing out that not only have we got this exponential change in technology, we're all living so much longer too, that the amount of change we will all see in our lifetimes is incredible. So how, um, how do we then respond to that as educators? Um, and I just wanted to share, um, in Heather's words more or less, we need to give up on creating specialists or hyper-specialists, focus less on transferring knowledge, more on the processes of entrepreneurial learning and creativity. In other words, Yes, of course, we need people with specialisms in medicine, for example, but also it's very important to equip the majority of our students with the skills to be T-shaped, so to step lightly and easily across disciplines, domains, different types of organizations through those six or seven or more careers that they will have in their lifetimes, many of which have not even yet been imagined. So we're kind of stepping up a level from teaching specifics to teaching more kind of general purpose skills around creativity and innovation that students can take in many different directions. Um, so, yeah, what, 
what should we do? How should we respond um, to these, these changes? Well, so I'm guessing that many of us in the room are familiar with the, the Bloom's taxonomy and the revision a few years ago that put creativity at the top. Obviously, we would agree that that's, um, you know, that's perhaps the most important um, skill that we can deliver to our students, the ability to think creatively. So that's the educational perspective. Um, then we've got from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, so more kind of economics-focused um, view, if the coming generations are to overcome the grave economic, social, environmental problems they will, that will be our legacy, there's general consensus that they will need to possess one thing above all, the ability to innovate and create. So that's the kind of economic argument. And then finally, if we need more from the World Economic Forum, there's the view from employers thinking about those kind of shifts in career patterns over the years to come. So in 2015, we've got this kind of list of key skills here with so complex problem solving at the top, creativity there at number 10. By 2020, we've still got complex problem solving at the top and we've got creativity kind of moving up in importance to number three. And of course, I'd argue that creativity is an important part of complex problem solving too. So I think that there's a lot of recognition that teaching giving students the skills to and the confidence to be creative is a really important thing that we can do to respond to um, the kind of change we're seeing around us. So, a bit more specifically, how should we respond in the classroom? Um, I'm just going to kind of um, present three ideas. Things helpfully come in three sometimes. So first of all, through what we teach, um, I think there's plenty we can do in terms of just including more creative subjects in the curriculum, making connections between these and other subjects. So not just STEM, but STEAM. Not just business, but art. So um, as mentioned, I'm based in a business school, CAS Business School, um, but the master's program that we teach is a radically interdisciplinary program where we have, yes, there are two modules on kind of business-focused thinking. There are also two modules from the School of Arts, School of Arts as well, so that's creative writing and a module where we encourage students to perform and create artifacts, things, pieces of art that they show off in a final art show to help them develop their creative skills, confidence, performance, communication. Um, we also have psychology, law and um, technology modules. So it's a real kind of mixed bag and we think that's really important in developing students' ability to be sort of open-minded and appreciate diversity, diver have respect for diverse points of view and understand how to kind of work with um, differences in background as they move between um, contexts. So that's what we teach. Then there's the environment we teach in, of course. So build a creative climate in the classroom. What I mean by that is building on work that was initially done in a business context, so um, surveying hundreds of businesses from um, across the world. Um, Isaacson and Ackerman's uh, 2011 published a paper with eight dimensions of creative climate intended for a business world, but there's a lot we can learn for the world of education too. So things like developing trust and openness in the classroom, encouraging the exchange of different points of view, coming back to the point on diversity, listening generously between ourselves and to our students, um, developing in students particularly tolerance of uncertainty and ambiguity as things change around them. We don't want that to freak them out too much. We want them to be able to kind of work with that. Playfulness and humour, very important for creative thinking. Um, and giving the students the freedom to develop their own ideas. Which leads on to the final point, um, and as we heard in the survey, the Gen Z are really ready for this, wanting this, so developing more approaches to learning by doing. So we know that creative practitioners, designers and artists um, develop their work by constantly doing, reflecting, learning, doing more, reflecting more, learning, etc. So there's this, we, research shows that um, Designers work by reflecting in and on action. But many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Donald Schoen's work around that. Um, and this is a skill we must develop in our students so that they can become effective, reflective practitioners. 
Um, and technology, of course, must be an important part of the mix that we provide students with um, in, in what we ask them to do. So making by doing, using a lot of times the technologies, the many and varied technologies that we can see around us um, to do that. So wrapping up for the future, for some years to come, our research the city is all about finding that right balance between the human, the computer, the physical, the digital, where that works, in particular for creative thinking, creative flow. So for some years to come, most jobs um, that we're preparing our students for will involve a mix of the physical and the digital tools, and also the human and computer capabilities. The computers aren't going to take over quite yet, but the balance is shifting in that direction. So constantly we need to be reassessing what's the best mix right now for ourselves and our students of tools, technologies, and at the same time, the more traditional kind of physical, human-centered approaches. Now, I was asked to end with a call to action. And what we decided on was, how can you build a more creative climate in your classroom? That's the thought I'm going to leave hanging. I guess we might come to responses to that uh, in discussion. Um, but that's it for me, that, and that's been me. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, um, what I'd like to do now is have a conversation about some of the, what we've seen in this study, and also, Frederick, to give you a chance to share some of your reflections and thoughts yeah. as you've looked at this as well. So let's start there. Yeah, I mean, uh to us, at least, I, I do mostly higher education with uh, companies and uh, professionals. But I would say, you know, uh, the interdisciplinary collaboration is the key. Mm -hmm. And it's also, for me, it's very hard to define what creativity is, because creativity can be whatever. All people in this room are creative. What we're missing is a process of unleashing that creativity. And that's where you're saying, you know, it's about environments, about processes, stuff like that. Um, and it's the same thing with companies now when you, you heard the term digital transformation. It's not about technology anymore. It's about how we as humans can work in this new world because everything is faster. Uh, basically, everyone has a phone in their pocket. Why not use that technology? Um, but when it comes to creativity as well, I think that there's a like, shift right now where technology is ahead of fantasy. It's something my old boss used to call the fiction of science. So the science is here. We can basically create whatever we want to, but our fantasy is not there yet, because the more we know, the less imagination we have, unfortunately. <laughs> so we have to learn ourselves to unleash that imagination, especially the kids, because they still have a little bit of that left. Uh, and the older you get, you, you, the more you know, the more controlled you get. So, um, and, and that's what we do for a professional. We help companies and, and, and students to teach you know, innovation processes so they can unle unleash this um, energy and power. That's interesting. Could you talk a little bit more about the ways in which you help companies also develop a culture of innovation, a culture of creativity? Absolutely. So, yeah, I have to use this word, digital transformation. I hate that word, but I have to use it so everybody understands what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, the system is in place now. You have the cloud servers, you have the webmail and all that stuff, but they kind of forgot how to work together. So what we do is like help companies bring together the different people they have at the company. And this may, this is very easy. There's no rocket science here. But all these people together can solve really um, hard, big problems together. But it has to be facilitated. So what we do, we do the sign sprints. Uh, the longest format is two days where we gather all these interdisciplinary people, around 30 people, and then we bring in external perspectives mm -hmm. and like spice it up with people, you know, it can be people with the right, ex uh, right perspective or the wrong perspective or be experts and stuff like that. And together, uh, we go from uh, research and discovery to uh, prototyping and test during two days. But then also it's about educating and give people, you know, this tools how to do this themselves. Yeah, interesting. Well, and I, Sarah, I want to turn to you for a minute. We had a really interesting conversation yesterday about the institutional challenges. So certainly there's a, you've left us with a nice challenge for educators. How can you be more creative in your classroom? Mm -hmm. But could you talk a little bit about the institutional structures that either help or sometimes hinder uh, sure, this process? Sure, yeah. 
Um, so we, um, the master's program that I spoke about was initially run out of an interdisciplinary centre for creativity and professional practice, which was a centre that cut across the university structure. So I'm guessing many people in the room are from universities where they're very kind of stove pipes and schools don't talk to each other too much. I think that's pretty much the norm in the UK is my experience. Um, so trying to make a kind of administrative structure that cut across that was quite a challenge. Um, it's just something that like the, the finance and it always comes back to the IT, sorry, um, but it's something that the finance systems can't cope with, the HR systems can't cope with. So, so everything that you try to do as a kind of truly cross-cutting centre was just a challenge. So um, what we've done in the end is move into a single school. Um, it turns out that the business school um, suits very well the directions that our students want to um, take. And we're finding that having a home in a single school actually enables us to kind of be much more efficient, basically effective in doing still that kind of interdisciplinary work that we want to do. So having a home and kind of reaching out from that home as opposed to trying to kind of be all things to all people perhaps, yeah. I wanted to also ask about, I think one of the things that's changing is the way in which students demonstrate what they know and can do that I think the traditional way to do that is with a degree, with pedigree, uh, but it's interesting how that's changing as well, and I'd love to hear about that from an industry perspective as well as from a student perspective. What does the future look like for how students show what they know and can do? Uh-huh. Can I go first? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm really into prototyping, and I think that that's, that's the way of getting your ideas from here out to the real world so people can start to interact with it. And when I talk about prototyping, I don't mean something technical or complex. Prototype can be anything that someone, someone else can react to, basically. And, uh, and I think, you know, to visualize whatever processes and, uh, you know, touch point or whatever will help people because you might have a really good idea, but in, if you're bad in writing or something, you, you can express yourself. There's so many tools out there now, and I mean, Adobe has a tremendous tools to do this, but there are also a lot of other out there with it. So the obstacles, is re there's really no obstacle of expressing yourself visually nowadays. And I think that's a huge advantage. Uh, I used to tell my students that if they, if they write a, like a boring word paper or, or, you know, or an email, just record yourself talking about what you just sent and that will add like 10 layers to, yeah. to the importance of that letter. It's, it, it is that easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah no, the, and the prototyping, I think, works very well in the context of learning by doing. Um, so on our master's course, we don't have any exams. I just did an open evening last night, and when I, when I announced to the um, people there that there's no exams, they went, yay. Because exams, I mean, for assessing the kind of work that we do and the kind of competencies that we want to give our students are really not necessarily the best way to kind of go about it. So all our assessment is done through coursework. There's many and varied forms of coursework. Some more academic essays, but equally we assess student performances, uh, artifacts that students produce, prototypes that students produce in their design work. So there's kind of lots of different things we can think about to um, assess the different competencies we're trying to develop. Not definitely not, well, no exams at all. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, I was a classroom teacher myself early in my career and realized I was teaching my students to write, a critically important skill, but also insufficient given how much of the way in which we communicate is digital, how much of it is visual. I look at the role of video and the importance of being able to communicate and share an idea in order to convey a message. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's, it's fascinating that you're exploring so many different ways in which students can really yeah. communicate. Yeah, yeah. C that communication piece. So. Uh, helping students to develop their skills in pitching as well. So, yeah, yeah. as you were saying, just kind of the, you know, the telling a story about the prototype. Absolutely, really yeah. important, I think, yeah. Well, we've, I can see we've got a question here, and so perhaps we should respond to that. Yeah. So, do you integrate tech creativity in existing courses? Are they extra activities? And perhaps you can share as well from some uh, of for, your experience. For me, uh, once again, what is creativity? Uh, I. I, in all my courses, if it's the business development or, or art direction, I, it's a creative mindset to yes. solving problems, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is this agile that you, you talked about, you know, testing, doing, making, testing, get reactions. So I would say it's, it, it, for me, it's included in everything I do. 
You also had an interesting experience in New York with people trying to achieve a particular goal, and that perhaps that doesn't foster creativity. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Uh, you mean about the, the third the week? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. We, we did some research when I worked at Google and found that a lot of uh, the, the big companies now, uh, they, they, don't, they usually have business background, the founders. And there's very few, I mean, Airbnb is one of them, where there's actually designers, the founders. So we started a school called 30 Weeks where we turn designers into founders uh, and, and teaching them the business skill and stuff like that because they already had a creative side. Mm -hmm. So we kind of added the, the more business aspect to it in, in an incubator in 30 Weeks and uh, a lot of them are very successful today. So we need more creative leaders. That's that's the message. <laughs> yeah, and I think you'd also describe the way in which uh, students expand their audience in terms yes. of who they're thinking about and where they're sharing their creativity, that it's not just designing for a particular goal, but really reaching a, a broader yeah. audience than just a And also you can see uh, there's a guy called Lee Fleming at Harvard Business Review, and he's been doing a lot of studies with this interdisciplinary collaboration where two people that are uh, alike, they, they're, they're solving problems, but very safe, and they don't make a lot of mistakes, but then they don't succeed in their thinking either. They will never have a breakthrough idea. But if you mix up the team, uh, they will fail a lot, but when they succeed, they will really be successful. And that's why we have to kind of embrace failing in whatever we do, which is very common in art and, and creativity. You have to, that's why these short processes of design sprints, mm -hmm. for example, is a very successful way of doing it, and prototyping. Yeah, take risks and learn from failures. Yes. Yeah. Fail <laughs> fast, not big. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Sarah, did you want to add as well to that one? Um, on that first question um, about uh, integrating versus doing creativity outside, I mean, I guess, so uh, for us in particular, because we're, it's a master's in create, innovation, creativity, and leadership, we have to teach some of the specifics of creativity. So we do teach some kind of, here's the theory of what creative processes are like, here's a ways of thinking about creativity. And of course, we also do or include the modules on creative writing and um, performance skills and so on. So we do, we specifically teach um, some elements of creativity, but I think I very much kind of echo um, your thoughts on the fact that it, it's a state of mind it, yeah. and it's a kind of a climate or an atmosphere that you um, ideally would have in all of your teaching. So I wouldn't want to see, okay, here's the, here's the standard lessons and now here's the creative session. That's like having your innovation team outside of all the other teams and never talking to them in, in business. So I think it really needs to be integrated. Yeah. I saw a really interesting example recently of a medical school, and I, it was Harvard Medical School, uh, the, and they were obviously training doctors to be physicians. They incorporated an opportunity for students to come and, to, and visit a museum and to practice the art of seeing, of understanding what they were looking at. Uh, when they went back into their practice, they were actually much better yeah. at interacting with patients, at diagnosing problems, because they had more experience seeing. Yeah. And so I think even if it's not a course of study that isn't specific to creativity, looking at a variety of ways in which you can help students develop the kinds of skills they need is really critical yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. thank you, both of you. Really fabulous. Thank I you. appreciate your, your thoughts and comments. And thank you, audience, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.